City of Milton Special Meeting Common Council to order Thursday, July 15th, 2021 at 6 p.m. And can I get confirmation of the appropriate meeting notice? Meeting notice was posted at Piggly Wiggly, Dave's Ace Hardware, and City Hall. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That motion carries and we have an agenda. The Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, for public comments, we have one person um, signed up for public comments. And did you want to comment now or later? I appreciate your careful planning. Thank you. So um, item number five, approval of the consent agenda. So moved. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Is there anyone opposed? That motion carries. All right, moving right along. Presentation, discussion, a possible action or direction on the Edgerton Fire Protection District option for the fire EMS services within the city of Milton. And we have Chief Pickering here. Thank you for coming to present to us tonight. So maybe before Chief makes his way up, <clears throat> I can give kind of a little introduction. So, uh, and I know this was in the Courier. So last week, uh, Chief Pickering gave a presentation to the uh, four townships uh, that surround the city of Milton. Uh, and at that meeting, he presented an option that included, uh, one of those options included potentially the city of Milton joining the Edgerton Fire Districts in addition to those other four townships. Um, certainly, that was uh, an option that uh, we hadn't, uh, you know, really vetted or or looked at, uh, but one that you know certainly seemed to provide some possible opportunities for us. A lot of questions came flying our way shortly after that, uh, so we thought the most appropriate approach would be to have Chief Pickering come in and give a similar presentation to the Common Council, so they could ask some of their own questions and then potentially relay some of the questions that were presented to them. Uh, by citizens, and uh, we provided some kind of staff questions to Chief Pickering ahead of time as well, it, and he responded to those, but it sounds like you'll address probably the vast majority of them during the presentation as it is. So um, it's all yours, unless anybody else, anything else? <clears throat> so I'll start out, first of all, Randy Pickering, I'm the fire chief for the Edgerton Fire Protection District, uh, been there about six years. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more background in a second. I'll apologize up front for those that sat through the uh, townships discussion. You're going to hear the same dry humor and the same jokes over again. Um, but hopefully we have better success with Zoom. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> and I promised somebody I was not bringing that up tonight. So um, let let me start out. A um, couple of people that are uh, are joining me this evening: uh, Deputy Chief Russ. Um, is our deputy chief, and I'll uh, we'll go through introductions of, of us here in a few minutes. Certainly, you know Chief Rhodes, and I appreciate Ernie coming back um, or coming tonight. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you know uh, he is very uh, well respected around the country, and some specialty things that he does. And he's spent a couple of weeks, um, so we appreciate what he does for for us nationally. Um, I mean, other people, everybody knows. So. <laughs> um, from an agenda perspective, we'll go through my and Jason's background, just so you know who we are and, and why we're actually standing here. Um, one of the things that it dawned on me when I was just photocopying the presentation from last Thursday night is that we have had probably 20, 25 hours worth of meetings and discussions with the townships posing questions to them about various things and we're going to get into those tonight 
it, it dawned on me that it would be very difficult to just start out assuming you guys knew everything that we'd spent 25 hours asking them questions about to get to where we are. Um, so part of what I'm going to go through is, is sort of catching everybody up on the key things that we walk them, the townships through and ask them to think about, to consider, to go back to their citizens, to decide, you know, priorities and that kind of stuff. Um, I think as anybody would tell you, there are probably 400 options to, to do this. There are, there are so many ways that it gets mind boggling you have to kind of narrow it down and say, all right, let's just throw these three models up there. Um, I, I didn't mean to cause Al <laughs> and his phone blow up on, on that Friday morning, um, but it was a baseline, right? If the townships were trying to figure out where they were moving to, you got to have a baseline from where you're coming from, which is a, a current arrangement um, that includes the city. Um, talked about where the conversations evolved from the town, um, the edge and fire protection district model. Um, I, I will, I'll simply tell you um, the very, very first conversation when um, Chairman Meyer called me a few months ago um, and we started talking about this, he, he basically said, well, how long would it take for the edge and fire protection district to give us a proposal? And I said about 10 seconds. And I actually meant that we have, we are a district that represents five different jurisdictions and have very different needs and demands and financial structures and everything else. Um, we have an operating agreement. And, and so, you know, if you want to know how we operate and how we would handle somebody coming in, it's really simple. I'll give you a copy of our, that's, that's how we operate. Um, so it's obviously a little bit more complicated than that when you start figuring old stations and that kind of stuff. But in terms of how we actually operate and how our finances are handled, it's all defined. Um, and then we'll eventually get to the illustrative samples. And I, I'm assuming somebody's following that along. Okay. Um, you are, and you have copies, right? Um, my background, uh, and you, you can read it, so I don't need to read it to you. Um, I grew up in Janesville, um, went off to college, um, have spent 40 years in business and industry. I actually retired last uh, June, so just about a year ago now, um, from a very large multinational corporation. Um, and so if you, anybody that works in business and industry, you probably realize if you manage to, to last 40 years, uh, for a single employer uh, that has gone through acquisitions, mergers, divestitures. Um, I've been through just about every scenario of adding and subtracting parts of an organization that you can imagine. I uh, retired at the general management level. Um, that was the day job. I have been a uh, paid on call or volunteer, depending if you go way back 45 years ago, it was truly volunteer back then, uh, fire service um, since the mid 70s. And um, I got promoted to the chief's level, a chief officer was actually a deputy chief at the time in 1992. And you can kind of see some of the things uh, that have transpired. Um, I've been on the Wisconsin State Fire Chiefs Executive Board. Um, I actually created their foundation for them um, and continue to shepherd that. Uh, I just last year, because I thought I was going to try to retire, <laughs> uh, retired from uh, Mavis, Wisconsin, which is the organization along with Illinois, uh, Indiana, Michigan, and uh, Missouri, actually, a small section down there. Uh, we coordinate the large event mutual aid uh, activities across uh, the state of Wisconsin and, and interstate, past treasurer, the State Chiefs Association, past president of a variety of other organizations. You can kind of read it. Um, Jason, you want to just talk a little bit? Well, so when I came, um, we had a lot of challenges and we had some things that, that were going to take a lot to be fixed. And what I realized was I needed somebody that was going to be there day in and day out to help get um a struggling organization cleaned up um and i'll let jason talk a little bit about uh, the back his background and you'll see why uh, he was the selected candidate um, 
Excuse me, could you go to the podium, please? Thank you. So, my name is Jason Russ, uh, originally from central Wisconsin, the Wassa area, Wassa metro area. Um, started in the public safety career, my fire career in 2003 with the Village of Weston Fire Department. Uh, Village of Weston Fire Department, um, like many departments, was a small department. It was in the process of growing. It had hired three individuals to cover a nighttime shift. It had hired three individuals to cover daytime. And eventually in 2007 was when I was hired full time there. Um, I was quickly brought up as the union steward for um, our local. Um, we were affiliate with local 415, so I've had experience on the labor relations side of things on that side of the table. Um, during my time there, uh, advanced to AEMT, numerous fire certifications, and eventually advanced to EMT paramedic. Uh, I've been a paramedic now since 2014. Um, during that time frame, that department decided to go through a merger. So I was on one side of the merger. I was on the employee side of that merger. Um, there were some things that I felt maybe I would have done differently, but it gave me some experience to how that process was done. Um, at that point, I joined my local department. Um, I had moved into the village of Rothschild. I became a uh, lieutenant of training there. And eventually I became the fire chief at Rothschild Fire Department. During my time at the village of Rothschild Fire Department, as a part-time chief, um, one of the things that we had was a neighboring community. We both were in the same boat where we were both uh, sharing a lot of personnel. We were looking for more personnel. Run volumes continued to go up. And at that point, uh, the village of Rothschild and the city of Schofield decided to sit down, look at what a joint merger would look like. And eventually we formed the Riverside Fire District with them. Um, I had been the deputy chief. At, I was full-time at another fire department during that time, Mosney Fire. Mosney Fire District. Um, during that time, I was the Deputy Chief of Fire and also covered inspections. So with that, um, I've had experience on both sides of mergers, um, on the labor side of things and on the um, management side of things and putting that together. So that's just a little background of myself. 2017 was when I made the move down to South Central Wisconsin and um, I've been the Deputy Chief of Operations over at Edgerton Fire. Thank you. Um, the next page um, is actually a single page that came out of a presentation that we did with Edgerton and several of the municipalities that, that actually took about three hours. I'm not going to do that. You're getting one page out of it. But what it tries to portray for you in a graphic form is how the fire service evolves. And in the state of Wisconsin, there are over 800 fire departments. 650 of them are volunteer or paid on call. We won't get into that whole thing. 123 of them are combination. So they are made up of both career full-time employees, part-time employees, paid on call employees, all that kind of stuff. 91 uh, departments in the state are fully career. The two sides are really easy to figure out, volunteer and career. Those, those are pretty much easy to understand. It's this combination world in the middle that gets pretty confusing. And so all I tried to describe for you there was at one end of it, there are departments that are predominantly paid on call and they have one or two full-time people. Usually those are departments that they need somebody to do the inspections. They need one or two people to be on the ambulance during the day. And as soon as you hire a full time person, strangely enough, you probably hired him to be the fire inspector, but you make him the chief because they're there and they're there every day. That's at one end. And then you get to the other end are the departments that are predominantly career, but don't have much depth and Ashland Menominee are, are two really good examples of that. Uh, the, Chief of Ashland, actually, the former chief of Ashland used to be one of my uh, interns many, many, many years ago. Um, but Ashland is a situation where they have career staff and they have two, well, they had two stations, they went down to one. Um, but when they got a working fire, the callback guys were 40 miles away. So they didn't have much depth. And so they, they had a paid on call 
component to their department that gave them the ability to handle the larger incidents, right? So you can kind of see the two ends of the spectrum. The way you move through that spectrum is really based on the demands you're placing on people's time. And one of the things that I mentioned to the townships when we were talking about it, when I first joined my first paid on call fire department uh, back in the, in the 70s, we might have two calls a week. And you know, my, my employer, thank heavens, very, very community minded. If I disappeared twice a week for a couple hours here or there, I mean, they knew I was gonna make that up, right? And they were okay with that. Right now today, the Edgerton Fire Protection District, we average three calls a day. You can't expect employers in your community to release personnel three times a day, every day. And so it, as you go through the demands of call volume, demands for your service, you actually have to work your way through this evolution. You start adding career staff. Real common one is you start adding career staff during the day, and then you rely on your paid on call at night. And then all of a sudden family obligations get into it and all the other things in our lives. And you start realizing you're not getting enough people coming in at night either. So then you got to go to 24 hour staffing, at least for the, you know, one crew and you use the panic, right? It's just an evolution. And historically communities that have got themselves in serious trouble. And I mean that very significantly serious trouble are those that are still stuck in how they operated 10 years ago. And that's exactly where Jason and I found ourselves when we came to Edgerton. We were trying to, Edgerton was trying to operate like it operated 10 years ago. Four years ahead of that, it was, it was, it was struggling. It wasn't struggling because people weren't interested, didn't want to be involved, whatever it was. It's just, it was too demanding. There was too much activity for them to be able to do. So again, that's kind of the background as to how a department moves through here. One of the things that, and we had a lot of fun with this, I had a slide put together. Um, our district board did not realize what they really were. They would come into the meeting and they would represent a community of maybe in one case, 712 people. Um, another one would come in representing a, a, a legal jurisdiction of maybe 5,000 people. And they'd sit at the at the table and they'd be making decisions based around who they were. We had to explain to them, you are not who you think you are. You are 100 square miles. You are a population of over 12,000 people. That's on a good day. Add the 40,000 that show up on the weekends, right? <laughs> and the interstate. And you are protecting $1.2 billion in equalized value. You have to start acting like 100 square miles, 12,000 people, $1.2 billion in equalized value and make decisions around who you are. So on here, the ones that are highlighted in orange, one of the things we did for them was put together a matrix of who are your comparables? And they would have told you their comparables were, I'll just, and I don't mean to pick on anybody in particular, but, but maybe a Clinton, no offense to Clinton, right? Truth was the five jurisdictions below us and the five jurisdictions above us are the ones highlighted in orange. Were Hudson, Monroe, Stoughton, Monona, Verona, although Verona's gotten much bigger in the last couple of years, that one's no longer valid. <laughs> Just, just for a point of reference, right? But you kind of see they were thinking they were one thing and they were very different. And so, you know, we, as Jason and I tried to help them, first of all, we all get levy limits, right? I, I have a lot of feel for Dan and everything he probably goes through to help you sort through uh, the challenges you have. But over the last five years, we have figured out how to move from where they thought they were to we are pretty much right square in the middle. Uh, from an operation standpoint, um, that was very much on purpose. I made a couple of comments there about paid on call personnel. Um, volunteerism is difficult and we all know it, it's hard to find people. What we're actually finding as we clean up some of the problems inside the organization, people really wanna be involved. 
They just have a limited amount of time they can do it. So if you use them for the talents they have at the times they're available to augment what you're doing, it, it actually works. Um, there's two sides to it. There's the practical side. Again, the call volumes, the number of inspections, the training requirements, all that kind of stuff. But then there's the intangible. One of the things that I have said to our board over and over and over again until they're sick and tired of listening to me, we are basically a service business. But when you start involving paid on call, we're basically like the Rotary. We're like the Lions Club. We are vying for their discretionary time. And if you don't give them a place to give their discretionary time to that respects them, treats them well, gives them the tools they need to do their job, they're just going to go somewhere else. And what I, I've said this to many, many departments across actually in the Midwest, when you start losing volunteers, don't look at them, look at yourself. Uh, and that usually answers the question as to why you're losing your volunteers. Um, next slide. Um, just really quick, as we explain to everybody, your citizens, your businesses, the people who come here uh, for vacations and travel really expect some pretty basic things. When something goes wrong, they want you to show up quick. They want you to have the equipment that's necessary to deal with whatever it is that went wrong. And they want people that know how to use that equipment and deal with whatever went wrong. It's actually pretty simple. The problem is you, much like us, and, and certainly Janesville and the rest of Rock County, we have some amazing challenges. You have the fifth largest lake in the state of Wisconsin that attracts a lot of tourism dollars and all the issues, golf cart rollovers and a few other things that come along with that. Um, you have business and industry. We have very large chemical operations, which are hazmat oriented situations. We have care facilities, I mean, just on and on and on and on. The number of things we have to train our people on is actually pretty amazing. But the point that I make with everybody who listens, and a lot of times I'll stop and say, if you wanna write down one thing tonight to, to keep with you and forget all the rest of it, just remember one thing, response time matters. Period. I give you two examples. These are national charts. The first one uh, is actually out of the nationwide database for how well we can, uh, on average across the country, how well we control a fire based on time. And again, depending on construction materials, I'm not going to get into all the physics behind this, fire doubles, doubles in size every 30 to 60 seconds. And after it's doubled once, it doesn't stop, right? Another 30 seconds, it's going to double again. Another 30 seconds, it's going to double again. If you don't get there and intercede in what's going on quick enough, and you can see the statistics, 6.6 .6 minutes, it's going to be beyond the object of origin on average. The, one, the second one actually is kind of strange to a lot of us. 6.2 minutes, it's going to get out of the room of origin. 6.7 minutes, it's going to get out of the floor of origin. And you just, you just keep going on, right? Response time matters. On the life safety side, it is much clearer, right? Your chance of survival if you are having a catastrophic health event, heart attack, stop breathing, drowning, whatever it might be, your chance of survival goes down 7 to 10% every 60 seconds. Response time matters. So when we started talking with the townships, and this is the stuff that we took them through in much more depth, so I apologize for taking you back through it, but the issue was government entities need to look at their territory, look where you're called, look for the places where, where it's gonna drive call volume. So cities are, are, are a, a unique thing, right? Because you're gonna have the places, but basically a city's a city, and you're gonna have calls throughout your city. But when you throw in a Lakeland campground, no offense to Lakeland or you know any of them, right? You throw in um, a leisure estates, over 700, right? Right, properties out there with three or four or maybe 10 because you know grandma invited all the kids. When you look at those kinds of places and where your call volumes are coming from, you've got to try to put your response resources to deal with the largest volume of calls. That's the right 
thing for a government to try to figure out. Um, very early in my career, um, I was on a department over in southwestern uh, Milwaukee County. We were an old township, so a square, six by six, right? 36 square mile township. We had four stations covering a single township. And I remember the first meeting when I was talking to Brian and Jeff and, and Rob, actually I was picking on Rob quite a bit, right? To do this right, you need four stations in Johnstown. You need four stations in Lima. You need three stations in Harmony, you need, right? I mean, those numbers, it just it's astronomical, right? And, and you could never afford any of that. So what you end up having to do is start to make decisions about where do you put your response resources to cover the largest volume of incidents or maybe your largest target hazards. Because there are places that, um, any of you have ever vacationed up in Duluth, you get out into the Harbor District, right? The, the lift bridge that goes out onto the peninsula, there's a fire station on that peninsula. That fire station probably gets four calls a year. The problem is when that lift bridge is up for 25 minutes, if there isn't a fire station out on that peninsula, nobody's getting a response for 25 minutes. So, so there are reasons why you put stations places that don't make sense from a volume standpoint, but from a target hazard standpoint. Um, I think the last one before I move on to what you've already heard before in the, in the previous meeting, where our conversations evolved with the towns. Um, we walked the towns through a series of planning sessions, talked about strengths and weaknesses of, of a variety of different things, but we basically asked them four very simple questions. Which jurisdictions are you asking us to try to figure out, right? Am I talking about trying to cover 30 square miles? Am I talking about trying to cover 50 square miles? Am I talking about trying to cover 100 square miles, right? Because you gotta figure out how big the picture is first. And then, for some of these jurisdictions, our classic is the town of Kashkanan, and I was kind of chuckle. I, I went to high school with the Berlin games, so I, you know, Bill gives me a hard time, I give him a hard time back. By the way, he won all the fights in high school. Um, <laughs> Bill's a tough negotiator. He has 27 houses in the town of Kashkanan, right? We'll deal with it, right? But that's not your, your biggest issue, right? When you look at Johnstown, when you look at Lima, when you look at the large areas we're trying to cover, we put together, and it, it's actually on the next page, so I'm not going to jump to it right away, but we basically put together for them what's called collision points. I, I have a very sophisticated database, has all the fire stations in the state of Wisconsin, their exact location. Right? I have it because of Mabus and, and coordinating mutual aid around the state, but it gives me a really good tool to say if a fire truck leaves this station and this station, where are they going to hit head on? So where are those collision points? Because that really basically, and, and the classic example, if you look at Johnstown Center, I think there was seven calls in Johnstown Center last year. From a public safety standpoint, would I like to put a station in Johnstown Center? Yeah, I really would, because it's a long ways down there. But can you really afford a fire station for seven calls? So you start looking at these collision points to say, where where is your best coverage coming from? and who should you be talking to about providing your coverage? The flip side, and, and I don't know, has anybody ever done a remodel on your house? It's kind of a common example, right? You'd love to just start over. And, and so I think, and, and I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot, but if, if you sat Ernie and I down on a chair and said there are no fire stations in Rock County, tell us where they all ought to go to provide the best coverage for the entire county. It's probably a totally different answer than where we are, right? Maybe, maybe not, right? But there are gonna be stations that are in the wrong spots today to cover what we're really trying to cover with them. But as a government official, I get it, you're under levy limits and you've got all sorts of restrictions on how much you can spend. So if I came in here and said, this is what you really ought to do, it'd be a really pretty map, you'd never be able to afford it. So what we sat down with the towns and went through was where do we where do we spend the money that you think you can afford to spend? And that's the first that's one of the questions. It's not written down, but that's one of the first questions, right? Everybody's got to decide how much can we invest in this? You tell me how much you think you can invest in this. I'll start trying to help you figure out where the best place to put it is 
if that's all you can afford. Now, anybody who knows me, Jason will attest to this. I'll tell you if you're making a bad decision, right? I mean, there's some things that, you know, oh, let's do this. I mean, no, that, that's a dumb waste of money because you're really not solving the problem you need to solve. And, and I'm not afraid to, that's what happens if you've done this for 45 years. You just tell people it's a dumb decision. Um, so we talked about who, what we were trying to cover, how much jurisdiction, um, talked a lot about the impact on response time. You can, you can obviously tell that's just something that's ingrained in me beyond belief. Um, population, call density, dispersion of the calls, the collision points, uh, and we looked at, at all of those stations. Staffing levels, this is where it starts to get really interesting because when you really decide, okay, one or two stations or three or four or whatever the number is, then how are you gonna staff them? Because that's really where the money starts adding up very quickly. Um, if you were to, and, and again, to the townships, if you were gonna ask me to try to staff a station with paid on call firefighters in Rock County, Wisconsin, I'm having nothing to do with it because you're just, you're not gonna get a response. You know, 100% paid on call in, in Rock County, given the demands we have on people's time and business, you, you can't do that. You have got to look at career staff to make sure that you've got an appropriate level of coverage and you'll see in a couple of seconds, and then the paid on call piece of it to give you the depth that you don't have because you can't afford to put, you know, nine people in a building 24 by seven, 365. Um, a lot of different ways, and Jason and I wrestle with this every day of the week. Um, the standard number is usually five. Um, there's a lot of logic behind the number five in a given station building. Ambulance crew is two. If you have five, that means if you have a second ambulance call, you probably then can get two ambulances out of the same building, right? If you have a serious medical emergency, a heart attack, uh, a drowning, something like that, where advanced life support skills are gonna be needed, you need both the ambulance and an engine crew coming along to help support. If you've ever seen one of those scenes actually play out, it's a lot of hands on deck really quick. So that's where you've got enough for one ambulance, one engine company of three. That is not a national standard. Three out of an engine company. If you notice, if it's then a structure fire, you now have four people to put on the engine. Because that's a lot of times you've heard of the word two in, two out. That's an OSHA standard. It's a, it's a state statute. I can't send two people into a, what we call IDLH, a, a hazardous environment. I can't send two into that environment if I don't have two outside. So if you're pulling up with an engine company of three people on it, unless you're going to violate, which we all do if we have to, but that's not a good thing, right? You want an engine company of four if you're going to an IDLH incident. So you can kind of see the math. Crashes with a pin, somewhere between eight and 10 people usually. Working structure fires, in a single family residential structure, it's a minimum of 15 people. You have the numbers that we try to build these things off of. And then you get to the discussion of the makeup of that staff. The simplest is 100% career. And that's just a math exercise, right? I'll show you in a second. It's a very simple math exercise. Or do you do it with a combination of career staff as a core with paid on call to give you the depth? And then we happen to have a very robust intern program um, who are students that are going through a two-year college degree program in fire science. Um, we pair them up. It's, it's always in teams of six, right? So if you have three shifts, there's two on every shift. One is a second year. One is a first year. The first year is not expected to be going out on a truck on a first response, right? They are a student they get one year of training before they're even allowed to, to get on the truck and go along with the more experienced crews. But it's amazing what those individuals can do for you. Um, a really good example of that, one of the biggest challenges Jason and I have been facing lately, um, our interns are getting hired by career departments before we can even get them through the internship. 
uh, we had one of our interns, uh, it's a three year internship because we offer them a paramedic internship in the third year. Um, we had one of our um, interns hired after the second year uh, by Racine Fire uh, just uh, last year. Um, he's now already teaching at the technical college down there, teaching incoming firefighters. That's the kind of experience we give these young men and women to make sure they're going out. Uh, as I said earlier, um, I, one of the greatest parts of this job, um, the second in charge of Green Bay Fire Department, one of the, what, Ernie, what, the fourth largest in the state, third largest in the state, is one of my interns. Um, his name will come up eventually, depending on where the discussion goes, because Green Bay has actually been at the forefront of bringing together a Metro Fire Department. And they've actually changed their name to Green Bay Metro Fire. Um, they've uh, brought in Alloway and Bellevue. Rob has done all of those negotiations. Um, and he and I are on speed dial a lot just because we're really good friends. But it's those kind of resources that you have available to you when you have that kind of a program. Um, the collision point map, I just threw it in there, not going to spend a lot of time with you on it, but at least from a concept standpoint, um, you know, we did these based on uh, where those stations are located. Um, Dave asked me a question one day because our stations and what we're proposing for the townships is that those stations are going to be staffed, right? They're going to have five people in them. And, and I'm, I, I always try very hard never to say anything negative about any of my partners, because I rely on every one of my partners around me. Uh, but Whitewater Fire Department, their ambulance is staffed, but their fire is paid on call. So they, they are still in a situation where they have to wait for the personnel to come into the station before the fire trucks can roll. We call that shoot time uh, commonly. So one of the terms or turnout time. Um, so when we did the maps based on response times from a Milton, a, a Milton Township station and Whitewater, we added the shoot time to it. That's the dashed line that you see next to the solid blue line, right? So if they're fully staffed, the trucks would collide right on the blue line. Given that they're about a minute, we, we used a minute, what did we use, Dave? Minute, 30 seconds? Minute, 30 seconds. You can see where it moved the line. So anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing that we went through with all the townships when we were trying to figure out um, I did kind of jump over this at the beginning. I realized I ought to come back. I get into a presentation mode and I kind of apologize, right? You get into a zone and you just kind of roll. As I said to the townships and, and have said to the newspaper several times, the Edgerton Fire Protection District does not have a sign hanging out the front door saying we're looking for people to want to join us. I mean, we're, we have our operations going, we have our challenges on any given day, we've got a lot of things we're working on. We're not looking to grow for any particular reason. When the townships called us, Jason and I basically took the approach of, we're offering educated advice. If, if nothing ever comes out of it, we're fine, right? We're, we're just, we've done this for a long time. We understand rural fire service very well. I mean, if you listen to Jason's background and my round, Right, we understand how this business works and we understand all the elements of it, the paid on call, the true volunteers, the support staff, the career staff. So we've been basically been offering advice to the townships about what you want to think about. You as elected officials have to decide. We'll, we'll give you the advice. We'll give you the best counsel we can give you. At the end of the day, you got to make the decisions. Comma, but I will mention if you make a dumb one, I'll... I'll I'll comment on it, <laughs> at least. Um, so now it brings us to what some of you had the opportunity to hear last Thursday night with the townships. Um, we started with three options. Um, and, and again, I do apologize to Al. I didn't mean to make his phone light up Friday morning. It, it, it's a baseline option, right? It's what the current Milton Fire Department is. Um, we took uh, the information that was, um, it was dated December 9, 2020. So one of the things I will say right up front, anything in there about option one, as it relates to what your city of Janesville option is, is just from the documents that were publicly available. 
um, as, and hopefully as Dan, I asked Dan literally one question, right, in the last three months, and that had to do with insurance costs. Uh, we didn't try to dig into stuff. We, we did not, you know, we did not talk to anybody. We just took publicly available information and tried to, to just put it in the same format. And actually what we did was we changed our format to match the format that the Janesville information had been laid out. So you could at least look line by line and see what it looked like. That's basically what we did. Um, the one thing we did, and literally it's simply one keystroke on a spreadsheet, I could change it in two seconds and, and recalculate everything. But that original proposal was based on starting that operation. Year one was, it appeared to us, 2022. All right, we're half, three quarters of the way through 2021, right? It's not happening January 1, 2022, unless you guys are really good miracle artists. Um, so we added one and a half percent inflation to the operating cost aspects of those numbers, not to the labor numbers, because the labor numbers were, were based assumably off the contract, right? So those would be the same. But things that could have gone up on you in a year, we just added at one and a half percent. I'm back that out in a heartbeat, or I could change it to three percent, whatever. You know, if your crystal ball is any better than mine, let me know because I'm just making guesses. Um, option, and I'm going to skip option two, but I'm going to go down to option three. Option three was actually what the townships asked us for. Um, they, we talked about what it would take to provide coverage for the four current Milton Fire Department townships. It's actually five municipalities when you throw Bill's 27 houses in the whole equation up in Kashkinan. And the decision that was made after a lot of the discussions was at least one fire station. Obviously, Jason and I, a lot of conversations, maybe it ought to be three or four, but I get right what that would cost, right? So the original base model was around one fire station and then the future potential, and um, my colleague from the newspapers probably only heard me say this about 800 times, right? Because <laughs> the Edgerton Fire Protection District has been looking at our call volumes and our demand for service over the last couple of years. And we've identified that that Newville and Hillside Road corridor is exploding. Not literally just figuratively, right? Um, for the town of Fulton, that is 32%, I believe, I go back to it's like 32% of all the calls that happen in the town of Fulton are happening in that corridor. What struck me was when I was talking to Brian and John and the people from the town of Milton, was it 31% for 33%? Somewhere is 33, 33% of all the town of Milton calls are happening in that same corridor, except just on the other side of the line. So when you look, and, and the map's up there, you can look at it, it's, it's an eye chart, but, but there is a ton of dots in that corridor. So as a fire chief, I've been putting it on the table, whether it's Edgerton alone or Edgerton and whoever else, we've got to do something about Newville. It just, from a fire chief's perspective, we got to do something about Newville. There are no decisions, there are no commitments, there, it's just illustrative, but I have been putting it on every document because the last thing I wanted to do to the townships, knowing what we've been talking about, is two years later come back and start talking about Newville and they're going to go, wait a minute, why didn't you tell us that two years ago? It would have factored into our decision making if we knew what your thought was two years down the road. So it's like, I'm not gonna be unfair to them and, and come back two years later and drop something on them. So that's the whole discussion around Newville. Um, and then, as I said, uh, go back up to option two, as a baseline with the five jurisdictions that are part of the current Milton, we just drop that in there as well. Um, I don't have it up, I could put it up on the screen. We have a very, sophisticated spreadsheet that takes all of the inputs you're going to see one of the input screens and all i got to do is change one number and it just recalculates everything for us right so we just put the baseline in there with the five municipalities um i know and, and dan's probably looked at some of the numbers 
one of the things that makes it really hard if you just look at the number and try to back into it, which I, I try, hopefully you don't, don't waste any time, Dan, I'll show you the actual numbers. Um, when we were talking with the townships, there were some townships that were, be, were being protected by, and I'm just gonna make illustrative numbers. This, this, these are not real numbers for anybody, but currently there's 41% of a township being protected when they looked at what we were proposing in the model, they said, hey, I'd like 64% of my township protected. Or there's a currently, we're at 60% and I'd like you to do 95%. So if you try to take the current distribution based on the current equalized value and figure out our numbers, you're never gonna get there, right? Because we've got a whole different set of equalized value distribution based on what the townships have said, hey, take this into consideration much the same way that's all in the spreadsheet i can change that and well, changing equalized value takes about two minutes <laughs> not two seconds but we can recalculate this a hundred ways from sunday you just have to get someplace where you look at three and say all right here's here's what the models look like does that make sense um all of them are combination model with a mixture of full-time paid on premise and interns using our baseline was three career staff as the baseline in that station so every station had three career as you'll see later on one of the stations actually has four during the day because we would put some type of senior command officer monday through friday eight to five kind of thing over the whole operation so that's a daytime person we then said, well, if we're gonna put four in the station during the day, let's see what it would take to keep four all night long. So we added paid on call hours overnight. So there was always four in that station. And then the station would have one intern. So there's the that fifth person in that station um, would be an intern. And Chief, you use yeah. the term career and full-time synonymously, right? Uh, absolutely, okay. sorry. And, and, and it's interesting because that's kind of a change over time um, there, there's a lot of words in the fire service that that get perceived certain ways. Um, so we're trying to use the politically correct terms at any given point in life. Uh, I'm getting better. I always refer to it as career. Quite honestly, I'm a paid on call. Right? I've been doing this for 46 years. Most people who know me had no idea I worked on a day job. They think my career has been the fire service. So I kind of get this idea of maybe career is the wrong word. Full time paid on call and interns. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Al. And uh, one question about interns. At, yeah. at what age, I mean, are they graduates from high school? Oh, yes. Okay. I, oh, and I, and I can, I'll, I'll go a little farther. Yes, these are, um, they have to have graduated high school. They have to be accepted into one of the associate degree college programs. In other words, we just, we won't take anybody or everybody. You have to be in the fire science degree program at an accredited, technical college and then they're paired first year and second year so the assumption is the first year interns are not the ones we're relying on to support the crews in working activities they're in their learning phase so they're learning for a full year before we start using them um, when they're in their second year they have they have to have the same certifications that a full-time firefighter has to have they participate in every one of the trainings that our full-time staff and our part-time staff uh, attend. And here's where it gets kind of interesting. This young man I was making reference to that got hired by Racine Fire. If you think about it, they're there all the time. So when we're training three shifts of career firefighters, each firefighter got one day of training on their, uh, over that time period. Those interns got three days of training. <laughs> It is just amazing, and they're, and they're just absorbing knowledge beyond belief. They, they, they become very, 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 very good kids. I mean, it's just amazing uh, when you watch them develop and grow. But yes, they're, that's, that's that intern. Now, the part that might be confusing, uh, we have kind of a mantra going within the Edgerton Fire Protection District of grow your own. And what we've realized is if we wanna to continue to bring in paid on call and people in the community and keep them involved in, in the service, we're a bedroom community. 
no offense, nobody, nobody works in Edgerton, right? They all work somewhere, right? So we picked up a mantra a couple of years ago of grow our own. So we've actually started a cadet program. That's different than the intern program, a cadet program with the high school where we will take high school seniors who have an interest in the program. We have partnered with Blackhawk Technical College. And so they actually go through and get technical college credit as well as senior high credit, right? There's a lot of programs like that out there. We put them through firefighter one certification training while they're in the cadet program. And then when they graduate from high school, they just go down and sign up for a test date and they can get their, their firefighter one certification. We've actually taken that a step farther. We're talking with the school district now about doing the same thing with EMTs. And we had four individuals go through it last year. Um, if you go out and Google channel3000.com, uh, channel3000 uh, in the 608, uh, the program that Josh Ryder does. He came down and, and filmed an entire day. And several of those interns or cadets were actually, they had speaking roles. And, and you'd be very impressed. And we were, we were very, very proud of them. Um, they already have eight signed up for next year. In fact, they wanted us to do it twice a year. And we're like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, because you bring that much energy into a building, it takes a lot of energy out of you to keep up with them. But it was just a phenomenal program. So the intent is then as they come in, um, two are paid on call candidates and one is an intern candidate. So. made on call. The fourth individual, and we're very proud of him, he chose to go into the military. And we're very proud that he's going to go off and serve our country. Um, but yeah, it's been just a great program for us. So that if, if you get if you hear and I realize I'm giving you way too much detail than you need, right. But you'll hear things like we use high school kids. Now we don't use high school kids, we are training the next generation of firefighters and EMTs and paramedics. So yes, they're in our building they're not allowed to go into an IDLA. They're not even allowed to, I mean, if they respond on a call, they are allowed ride along, but they have to follow the same ride along protocols that a member of the public would have to ride, uh, have to follow. So we're not using high school kids <laughs> or abusing them. <laughs> um, and then um, the, plan, the, the plan, right, is all of these individuals on the career side um, our paramedic level individuals. So they would be um, at least two of them. And the, the bit about, and I just, this is one of these where I, I go too far. People have vacations, people have holidays, people are gone, right? If you do this right, you can then backfill somebody who's not there on a given day because of a day of vacation with a, an equally trained uh, paramedic paid on call. We have, how many we got? Four or five? Paid on call paramedics? Four right now. Uh, we have seven more that are going into training. Um, so, you know, if, if we have a paramedic off, it may be a paid on call, but but we're going to backfill them with a with a paramedic or a firefighter, whatever whatever we're missing, we're going to backfill with the right certification. Um, the next page uh, is just graphically what options two and options three look like. Um, I, I put the map up there of, of option two, obviously. Um, you know, what's interesting about option three, we, you, you have to do something, right? I mean, set aside you have a state requirement that you have to do something. You were going to do something for your citizens. We were just making no assumptions as to where that might be, right? That's, that's totally up to you folks how you want to do that. Um, option two, we just dropped a dot in um, that, that appeared to cover a large bulk um, German client there, there, Jeff, sorry, I turn it. You know, Jeff and I have spent a lot of time uh, talking about some of the areas in the town of Harmony that are outside of that five minute window. You know, I want to try to figure out how to get them inside of a five minute window. Um, but at a certain point, there's only so much you can do unless you actually want to put four fire stations or three in your case, Jeff, you're okay with three stations? 
<laughs> right. So, yeah, exactly. Right. You'd be out of. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you guys get it right. That it, it's a value judgment kind of decision. You got to look at where your volumes are, where you can practically put a station. Um, one of our one of the cute stories is the, the potential Newville station. We're actually working with the state on that one. Uh, we're doing some things in cooperation with the state patrol and the Department of Transportation. We had the perfect spot for that building. Absolutely perfect. We brought an engineering firm in and they said, you can't afford the engineering cost to build a building on that particular tract of land. And actually they were afraid to tell me that because I, I get a little demanding about, you know, don't, I don't take no real easy. Um, they were really afraid to tell me that, no, there's no way you're gonna build a building on that piece of land. I get it, I can't fight physics. So we've actually, we're now working with DOT on a, on a second location for that building. Um, we laid out kind of the difference as we understand it um, between the Janesville model um, that, you know, was released in the newspaper. Again, everything we're taking is just publicly available information. I say that not to suggest that everything we read in the newspaper isn't 100% accurate, but we're, <laughs> we, we used what was publicly available. Um, from our perspective, the, the big differences between the two models would be the Edgerton Fire Protection District is a participative oversight organization. We are an independent district. Um, we are not a city department. Um, and, I, and I'd love to have Ramona come over. I'm sure she'd be more than willing to. She actually speaks very highly of the fact she doesn't have to spend any time during her day worrying about all that fire department stuff. <laughs> and the district's got to figure that out, right? Now, when it gets to budget time, right, there's a lot of interaction around the finances, right? But the daily operations, we are a totally independent, self-sustained district. We, we do everything that we have to do our own, uh, except under state law, we can't levy, right? The levy has to be on the municipality's levy. Um, so we, you know, as long as that's a cooperative arrangement, we try to take all the headaches off your back. But each of the municipalities that are part of the district have a vote I have a seat on the governing board and, and and they are in charge of every decision that's made that's responsible to be made um it i'll, I'll put it out there because somewhere along the line you're going to see it and i might as well address it right up front um every municipality has a seat on the board comma except for the city of edgerton in 1992 there was a very good reason, and if you want to, you know, buy me a Pepsi, we can get into what was going on in 1992. There was a very good reason why they ended up with two seats on the board. So the city of Edgerton does have two seats on the board, and it's a reason that made sense in 1992. Every one of them would tell you it makes no sense anymore. And quite honestly, if you're doing it based on equalized value, this, the town of Fulton is a higher equalized value than all of the city of Edgerton. So of course, Fulton always wants that second seat. And, he, and if you know Evan, right, he, he just does it out of gist, right? Because everybody realizes one vote per municipality and that's the right thing to do. So that's the way our, our board is set up. Um, we use a combination staffing model, uh, the blend of, of career, part-time, paid on call, and interns, I beat that one to death, so I'm not gonna go back over it again. Um, we are very proud of the fact that, that our uh, full-time employees are members of Local 580, that is the local that also represents Janesville. Uh, we have, at least what I believe, is just an absolutely outstanding relationship um, with them and we've done a lot with them through the years. So we're very proud of the fact that our employees are uh, part of that same uh, union family. Um, a lot of our paid on call and paid on premise are paramedics elsewhere, firefighters elsewhere, uh, much like your current department. I mean, I think you guys know the makeup of your department. These are people that have a passion for what they wanna do. When they come home, they, they wanna do that same thing for their, for their community. So we're very blessed in that respect. Depth of response, um, this is where, as I said, it gets a little bit different. Um, 
when we have a, a response out of our buildings, we're hoping it is it is a it is a hope, right? It's not a guarantee that you'll get all the people coming back in, right? But if we have a response out of our building for one call, we've got personnel that are coming back in. Um, my classic joke is any fire department in the state of Wisconsin that has a dumpster fire during deer hunting season, you have to call mutual aid. None of us have anybody during, <laughs> during deer hunting season. But I'll give you the other side of that example. Um, and actually, <laughs> um, Brian and, and were you there, John? I can't remember. Brian and Jeff and yeah, were there at, at our district board meeting last Thursday night. Um, that meeting got interrupted four times. <laughs> Um, we had four calls going simultaneously. Every one of those calls got a first out response in that minute and a half time frame because of the people who came back in and were in the building when the next call happened and the people who came back in, I, you know, I can go on and on and on, but that's, that's where that combination model gives you that depth that, that you Either you have to pay for it or, or you get it on a part time basis right so. Um, the other thing and, and you can obviously figure this out, you know when I talk about the critical nature of response time. What I want to try to do is get as much resource spread out over the widest geographic area that I can safely. Right goes back to the four people who got to be on that engine company right, but I don't want 15 people in one building. Right, I want them spread out so that as many of the constituents within the territory that we can have the potential for that five minute response time. Then just understanding there's no way we're going to deal with Johnstown <laughs> Center. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I think that touches that one. Um, our district agreement uh, dates back to 1992 the original five jurisdictions. It has been amended three times. Uh, it was amended literally two months after it was created in 1992 because somebody figured out they had a word wrong that was preventing us from being a tax exempt entity. <laughs> so they decided we probably better fix that. <laughs> um, the other two have uh, been amendments as state statutes have changed through the years and we amended the agreement to make sure it, it continued to be consistent with state statute. There really has been no fundamental change to the way the district is structured since 1992. Um, we, within the realms of trying to be polite, have basically said new petitioning municipalities would be uh, accepted, um, ha ugh, would be asked to accept the basic concepts of the agreement as it stands today. The district has absolutely no interest in sitting down and trying to negotiate anything different. It's worked for us. It works really well for us. The municipalities like it. We're not going to start playing games with it. That said, the agreement does list very specific things about the jurisdictions that are covered, the sections of every township and those kinds of things. So we know that to accept new petitioning members coming in, there would have to be an amendment to the agreement to incorporate them into the agreement, right? But in terms of getting into a lot of negotiations, um, no interest in that whatsoever. Um, basic concepts of the agreement, um, it is, Brian, what is it, about seven pages long, eight pages? Yeah. Somewhere in that range. Yeah, it is. It's a pretty easy read, but this is just a summary, right? I, this is the standard disclaimer you get in a presentation. This is not everything. This is just the, the highlights. Um, the district owns all of its assets and, and not only owns them, but controls them. Um, so we own all the assets. Um, each vested community, vested meaning the opposite of vested community would be a contract community. We don't have any now. It appears that Kashkanan might be one of those if, if that were to go somewhere and, and the board is fine with 27 houses. Much beyond that, not a lot of interest in contracts because there's just a lot of things happen there. Uh, but they get one commissioner and one alternate. Um, I mentioned that Edgerton does have two. Um, the district board, uh, or the district's budget is levied by the municipalities, both the operating and the capital. And 
Al asked, and or assumedly this one came from Dan, I'm not, right? Um, we've never had one of the municipalities say, well, can we just, can we just cover it, you know, our portion of the obligation over seven or eight years, whatever it is up front. Nobody's ever asked, I think, I think any possibility, right? It's a district board that as long as it's fair and equitable to all the jurisdictions and nobody's out advantaging anybody else by doing something, they are very flexible. We, we have a really good operating board. So the answer to that question is absolutely, right? If, if, if a jurisdiction came and said, you know, it, as an example, we're buying a new ambulance next year. Um, probably gonna be in the neighborhood of 250,000 or so. Um, you know, if one of our municipalities came and said, we want to give you our portion right up front, I, I guarantee you the board would go, sure, fine, right? And then we'll just figure out how to allocate the rest of it to the other ones. Um, the other one, and I'm just trying to remember some of the questions, Al and Dan, one of the other questions was, um, we do allocate the capital debt service based on equalized value. So in any given year, can a municipality's portion of the debt service or operating, right? And, and Jenny will attest to this, right? In some years, it might go up a little bit. In some years, it might go down a little bit. Um, and so, yes, it is, it is something that does vary. It is not a frozen um, number. And the way that all five of our municipalities would answer this question is, you know, for the last 29 years, we've known, hey, every once in a while we get a little plus, every once in a while we get a little, you know, negative. It's just the way the game, you know, it's just the way the district has worked and it, it's worked very fine, but it is variable. Um, the way we approach budgeting, um, this is not written anywhere. Right. This is not in an agreement. This is not signed by anybody. This is just the way we approach a approach budgeting. What we realize is that whatever we do, you as a municipality end up having to live with. Right. So if we do something that puts you over your levy limits, right, we've just put you in a bad spot. And that and that doesn't lead to good relationships over time. So the way that we manage our budget from a philosophy standpoint, we take the net new construction from all of the jurisdictions. We come up with whatever the average net new construction is. Last year for us, that was 1.12%. Not much to write home about, but it was 1.12%. We then, that's what we use as our cap on growing our operating budget is whatever the average of the net new construction of our municipalities is. And obviously, and I can see Dan's head turning already, right? So if you are a municipality that grows more than the average, you're gonna get an advantage, right? Because you can actually lever, levy for a higher amount, we're gonna take less of it. But if you are, if you grow below that average, you're probably gonna have to go find a couple of bucks somewhere else to make up uh, the difference. But that, that's been our operating philosophy for the last six years. And, and quite honestly, um, our budget meetings take about 20 minutes. Um, now, we do a lot of work up front, right? So the municipalities know all, everything up front, but the budget meetings are pretty short. Um, Dan and, and Al probably are very familiar with CPI plus two. We utilize CPI plus two. Um, you don't have to. You're not required to, but it is an expectation of the district that you will pass that resolution because the way the law reads, every member of the district has to pass the resolution for anybody to use it. So that's a requirement that we, we put in our municipalities that they have to be willing to pass it. You don't have to use it. You just gotta be, you know, play nice in the sandbox with your fellow. We have one municipality that does use it. The other four do not. Um, we do our own borrowing. Um, on average, uh, we borrow somewhere between about 160 to 250, 260,000 a year as a just a normal whatever's going on in that particular year. Next year, it's it's an ambulance. Um, 
we have our capital plan laid out for 20 years. So if, if you ask me when our next pumper needs to be replaced or when the next ambulance after that, I can, I can show you on the plan, here's where it's planned. The reason we do that is we take that 20 year plan to our municipalities because, and I'll just pick on city of Edgerton as an example, they may have a large sewer project in a particular year, or they might have, you know, something unique, rebuilding of Highway 51, you drive us all crazy, right? And so if, if they come back and go, boy, you, Randy, you got to get that out of 2027 and get it into 2028 for me. I mean, that's the kind of things that we do with our municipalities is work with them. So we're not putting an unappropriate un burden on you. Um, We've also been developing a capital strategy over the last five years, I think, right, Jason? Um, where as we, imp as we increase our borrowing year over year over year, we normally borrow for either seven or eight years, depending on what the, what the device is or how big it really is, which means that we'll get to a point after that seven or eight years where we'll start freeing up debt service and now we can roll forward on a normal capital plan without actually even having to add to the capital levy. I'll ask me in three years how that works, but we're, we're, that, that's the plan, right? It's all about working with our municipalities to make sure that we're not causing them problems, at least that they don't know about. Um, the classic, of course, is the word aerial ladder, <laughs> right? Whenever that shows up on the screen, everybody groans and everybody goes, oh, God, seriously, do we have to have one of those? The answer is yes. Um, but you're gonna know about it, at least from us, 20 years out, right? In terms of where that falls on the capital plan. So we all kind of work together. Uh, oh, I, I know Al asked me a question uh, about the stations and the borrowing. Um, we had originally projected 30 years just as an illustrative. Um, there are state laws about 20, you know, what you can do for 20 years. Um, City of Edgerton actually just worked out a 40 year loan uh, to replace, and Jane, keep me honest, it was the entire sewage treatment plant, right? That is levied or that is borrowed for over 40 years um, under particular government programs. We're actually working with those same government agencies to see whether or not we can get um, the same kind of borrowing capability against our building projects. Um, so yes, I mean, we, we know there are certain things you can do, certain things you can't. Um, we also know there are ways to, to deal with those. So yes, the, the station projects are all amortized right now over 30 years. Um, just kind of the way we did it. Uh, ooh. Um, we are a fee-for-service district, and we have been, I, I hope, very upfront with the municipalities. Um, I'll give you a couple of numbers in terms of the impact of this. Um, Edgerton Fire Protection District, 100 square miles, um, 14 vehicles, 45 paid-on-call staff, 991 calls last year about 1.2 million in operating. Milton Fire Department, um, 90 square miles of territory. What's the total number of vehicles? I forget, Milton's got, remember Ernie? 11, something like that? Brian, maybe? Seven plus, Seven plus the boats and everything else. Right? Where I'm going with this is our two districts mirror each other almost verbatim in terms of coverage, in terms of assets, in terms of staffing, except I have seven and a half FTE personnel, Milton has three. Our budgets are exactly the same. How can we do it at 1.2 million, right? Milton can't, that, that'd be the question, right? That you'd be asking. The answer is we have a CQI process on our billing process for a while. And Jason, I wanna, was that two years ago? We were number one in the state, three years ago? Yeah, before for that billing agent, recovery rate on billing for service. 50% of our total operating budget comes from fee for service. So we're a 50 50, only half of our operating budget goes on the levy. Our impact 
to our citizens on the levy is $62.50 per 100,000. Again, publicly available numbers, when, when I ran the illustrative numbers on the Milton Fire Department, Milton Fire is $95 per 100,000 on your citizens. So one of the things that we've talked to the townships about is we think we have an understanding. We know how we can deal with this. We think we can make it better. I mean, I, I'm being somewhat elusive here, but we know we can make it better. Our intention would be to get it to work the district towards that 50-50 so we can get that impact off of your levy, which frees up very precious dollars that I'm sure Dan would love to have. Um, so we've been very upfront with our municipalities that we are a fee-for-service district and we are very good at it. Um, one comment that we kind of underline though is that the municipalities do not become liable if there is an unpaid bill in your jurisdiction. Um, and I never even thought about that, except one of the townships brought up, there are places around the state that do billing, but if the fire department can't recover it from the person that was billed, then that underlying municipality has to, has to foot the bill. That is not, we don't do that. You, you, you do not become, or, or members of our district do not become liable for unclaimed recovery. Um, so just to make sure I've said that. Um, the district board, um, it is an oversight board, right? And, and they're very good at what they do because um, they ask very good questions. But when it comes to personnel matters, they function basically like a police and fire commission under 6213 state statute. Um, they are, the way we structure it, they are responsible for approving hiring, firing, and disciplinary actions. Other than that, operations is on Jason's back. They, they don't get involved in anything from day-to-day -day operations. But if we do have, uh, we do have them approve all hirings, um, all terminations, um, and then all disciplinary action. And if you're familiar under, we're, we're constituted under chapter 66, not under chapter 62. And chapter 66 has defined language about um, disciplinary action. And it's actually very good language if you've ever read it. So we, we use that and we have used that. Um, a member jurisdiction of the district um, can detach. It's 60 days notice, right? If, if, if you, that, that's, that's it, it's 60 days notice. That's on the positive side. <laughs> Second sentence is the one you want to pay close attention to. The only obligation you would carry is that if there was debt service incurred during the time that you are a member of the district, even though you detach, you are you continue to be responsible for the debt service that was created while you were part of the district. You don't inherit stuff that happened before, but if you come in and you leave, if there was $2 million worth of borrowing during the time you were in, you will, you will be responsible for the debt service against that 2 million or a negotiated settlement that's just a, that's a buyout or a payoff or, or whatever. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with this. This is exactly the way school districts function, right? If you ever, you know, if you're a jurisdiction and you ever tried to pull out of a school district. Um, our expectations, um, we laid these out to the township. Um, we would like to see unanimous approval of anybody that wants to join the, the district, but we also understand, you know, people have different opinions, but the board is going, would not accept anything that came from a municipality that didn't have at least two thirds majority supporting uh, applying for membership. Um, costs incurred by the petitioning municipalities, regardless of the outcome, uh, are the responsibility of the petitioning jurisdiction all legal and mutually agreed upon expenses, come back to that in a second, all legal incurred by the Edgerton Fire Protection District in the process of bringing somebody new in is also borne by the petitioning jurisdiction, regardless of, of outcome. We've been very upfront about that second half of the sentence. So far, we haven't 
seen anything that says we would go to any of the current people we're talking to and say, oh, and by the way, you're also going to be responsible for this, this, or this over there, right? It really is just our legal expenses. What we have said to every one of our municipalities is they are not going to incur any levy impact for expense associated with managing somebody that wants to come into the district. It's just, we're trying to be fair to the current pay taxpayers, right? Um, we haven't identified one, doesn't mean we won't figure one out, right? If we gotta go hire a consultant to do something about assess something or other, right? The, but those would all be mutually agreeable. We're not gonna incur expense that anybody that's petitioning doesn't agree to accept. Um, um, oh, the, the comment about CPI plus two, again, it's just, that's a requirement that you'd have to agree to be willing to pass CPI plus two. Um, the next one, I think probably Dan and Al would be very, you know, are really interested in, and this is probably one we could take offline and I'll spend two, three, four, 10, 12 hours, whatever you want. Um, because the levy mix is so different between the current jurisdiction and what we understand of the Milton jurisdiction, our levy is 50-50, and it literally is. It's 49.9 and 50.1. Um, the current Milton arrangement based on the publicly available data to us appears to be 80-20. Uh, so if we just put all the book, you know, if we just put everything into one pot, right? There's a ton of cross subsidy going on here that, that jurisdictions aren't gonna, aren't gonna go along with, right? So what we have said is we will, we will literally manage them as two separate budgets. So, I mean, I know Dan, I'm guessing Dan probably asked that question about how would we manage it. Uh, we use CPERT as our auditors. Um, we have very, very good relationships with them. Um, we would have them set it up. So we would manage the budgets associated with the five current jurisdictions and then the budgets associated with whatever the pet petitioning jurisdictions would be independently and develop the levies associated with them using the guidelines we've talked about. We're not gonna change that, right? We would do that totally independent until such time as we can get those two in sync with each other. And then once we get them in sync, then, then we can stop paying the extra auditing cost, right? We'd put them all into one. Um, but at least until we can do that, we'll manage them independently. Why would you, um, I'm just trying to understand, why would you think that your collection rate would be different if it's being processed in, by the same firm under the same framework? Why would it be different irrespective of municipal boundaries? So in some of the townships, there are no billing in the first place, right? So, so, so for some of the townships, they're having to accept the fact that we will now start billing their citizens where they're not being billed now. That's the simplest one. Um, the other one um, is a little bit more subtle than that. I'll just pick on Medicare because we all love to pick on the federal government. So nobody's offended by picking on the federal government. Medicare and Medicaid have people who are dedicated to figuring out how not to pay the bill you send them. We have a CQI process embedded in our organization that is more than phenomenal. And, and it goes with a person's name, I'm just not gonna use it, but we have a person who knows how to make sure that when our reports go in, they are going in and they're gonna get paid. Um, at one point in time, again, three years ago, we had a 94% recovery rate. We were the best recovery rate in the state of Wisconsin for that provider. Um, we're currently at 88%, if you want to know. Um, and a lot of that is because of COVID and just everything that's been going on. Plus, paren, we have the interstate. Try, we have 14.7 miles of the interstate. Just that we had a, a actually could have been a very tragic accident this afternoon. The, the young ladies, very, very, very lucky. Um, she is from New York traveling to Montana. What's interesting about that is all of our personnel are aware that when we get presented with a situation like that, here's the documentation we've got to have. 
because the chance of ever seeing that individual again is just slightly lower than zero. We know how to make sure to the best of our knowledge, and we have a very detailed process to make sure that that bill will get paid. So that, I mean, that's really the big difference, Al. We, we are some reference to, I don't want to even go there. They, they, this person is very renowned in terms of their expertise on how to make sure we're getting billing. And we're seeing the backside of it, right? We are 50% of our operating levy or operating budget comes from bill fee for service. We're, we're not any better. I mean, we're not, our call mix is the same as anybody else's call mix. We're not any different. So is there, is there any concern from your district that there seems to be a heavy reliance on one individual? What well, happens if that individual leaves? <laughs> I, I think in a small organization, so I, I, it, it may be inappropriately, if Dan decided to leave this afternoon, my guess is you're panicking too, right? All of, no, you're not, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, I mean, personnel comes and goes, right? Yeah, you know. exactly. So they have a backup. In fact, we have one of our youngest paramedics who is currently going through training on what that person does for exactly that reason, right? You can't have all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to lose that. Now, that person has an expertise that has developed over the years. So if that person left, yes, we'd lose the expertise factor, but we have the documentation as to how to do it. So what, and I give Jason a lot of credit for this, he recognized that. And we've started putting somebody into that role to make sure that that doesn't go away from us. Good question. On an operational standpoint, that was one of the things that I identified as that. Want to give up that knowledge and that expertise because that was her, that was that individual's thing. Um, but I myself came from. And Chief Pickering, can you repeat everything you said for the people on Zoom? Sure. <laughs> they couldn't hear um, it. Thank yeah, you. And, and I respect that. Um, so that is one of the things that Jason identified as a weakness when we did our SWOT analysis of what our strengths and weaknesses were. And so we have put that in place to make sure that we're getting the next generation trained, that that expertise doesn't go away if that person were to, to leave. So I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about fee for service, you're talking about billing insurance companies or Medicare. So whether it's a fire, you would bill the house insurance company. Property, property, property insurance. insurance. Yep. So, yep. okay. So it's um, so then, if they deny it, then is it the homeowner that has to negotiate with their insurance company? Yes. Um, or ends up negotiating with our billing company. Um, one of the things um, that our company that they do, and, and I get I get involved in the hardship cases, right? And 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 they exist. Um, we will work out you know terms over twelve months, twenty four months. Um, you know people that are on structured income, they'll actually you know look at that structured income and figure out what's reasonable. And they'll come back. I mean, it requires my approval before they can actually enter into it. But if they've worked with somebody and it's going to take 28 months to recover it, that's absolutely fine. So, yeah, there's, there's a whole process for doing that. Um, the only ones that get really ugly, and I can only think of two actually in six years, um, where we actually work with the municipality and it ends up getting put on the tax bill. Those are very rare. So, good question. Yep. Um, um, I have a quick question yeah, with regard yeah. to that. You said that if there is, if the payments are not made, the municipalities are not responsible. Correct. Who is? The, the district basically eats that as an unrecovered, there's, there's an accounting term for it. What am I thinking? It's a write-off. It's a, it's a write-off. It'd be a write-off for an allowance for a doubtful account. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, I mean, we carry an operating reserve. Um, and so we know if we have to write off, you know, $2,000, $3,000 a year, I mean, it's coming out of the operating reserve. 
And so obviously in our, in our fee structure, right, it's, it's like any other business, right? You know what your uncollectibles are gonna be, or at least you better, right? And you build in a slight buffer, a risk factor into your fees that creates enough so you can cover your uncollectibles. That's just, that's just basic business. Good, and then my other question is, um, are the people that are sitting on for each municipality and representation, are, is everyone elected officials or are these citizens? Good question. Uh, it's a mixture. Um, I got to actually try to do this. Um, three of the four of the six board members. So let me do it this way. Three of the board members are the actual town chairman for their townships. A fourth elected official is the, uh, tre the, the chair of the finance committee for one of the municipalities. So four of them are elected. The other two, one from a township and one from the city are citizens. But, but that is that is at the mayor or the town chairman's discretion of that municipality. We, we have no, I mean, our, our agreement doesn't say that we get veto power if we don't like the person you appointed. Um, occasionally we'll lock the door and they can't, no. <laughs> um, right, it's, no, it's, it's what that municipality believes is in their best interest. And um, we've had, um, through the years, I mean, there's change and people come and, and people go. Um, we actually had one former fire chief um, that is a member of the board, right? Brings a very topical expertise. Um, usually finance oriented people get to be the ones that get put on that. So totally, totally up to that elected body. Yep. Um, and then there was a question about, about uh, shared costs. Um, and I'm, again, a, Dan, I'll spend all the time you want sitting if you want to look at it. Um, we identified uh, a certain amount of costs that would be considered shared across the entire district uh, of existing and new municipalities. It's basically the district wide resources. So it's me, um, Chief Ross, um, our division chief who's responsible for prevention and inspection, doing all the inspections and writing and making sure that you as a municipality get your 2% dues and all that kind of stuff. Um, that individual, and then the administrative staff. So we, we have a bookkeeper. Um, we are planning in there for a scheduler. If this were to grow the size that it potentially could grow, um, we need somebody that's responsible for the scheduling. Um, and then the costs associated with our headquarters building. Um, we actually, today we have three uh, physical facilities. Um, we have the fire station, which probably everybody's familiar with. We have our own training center, um, training tower, maze building and all that kind of stuff. And then we were fortunate enough to get the bank building next door to the fire station. It's kind of a short walk, but we have that bank building. That is our headquarters building. All of those costs are tracked independently by facility, of course, the headquarters costs, which would apply to everybody that's in the district would be in that shared cost. So, and, and then the auditing, right? The, you know, the auditing of the books, the annual things like that. So that's, that's the things that went into the shared costs. And, and again, Dan, I'll, I'll give you the exact breakdown of what's in there. Um, you have, oops, wait a minute, yep, yep. No, I'm sorry. So the next one, and, and actually, Brian and John, you, you guys didn't see this one. I, I, I put it in specifically because I think there was some questions about it. Um, the calculation model that we have for determining costs, there are five or six pages of input screens. We can just go in and plug in whatever number we want to plug in. So the staffing models for the um, option two, which was the six jurisdiction staffing model, was one captain be a 40 hour employee, eight to five, six firefighter AEMT. So basically, six firefighters, which basically meant two on duty at any given time. And you, you guys realize there's two stations involved in this. So there'd be one at each of the stations. Underneath there, and this is um, 
where I probably the best place to put it. It's called regional differential. Every one of these line items has a cost, has all of our benefits identified, you know, all of those things. It's all, it's all behind it in the formula. One of the things we know is that we're competing with Madison Fire. We're competing with Monona Fire. We're competing with Beloit Fire for the people. And it's no secret, you cannot find, we can't find enough people. We are begging the technical colleges to turn out more paramedics for us, right? We just can't find people to fill all these positions. One of the things that our district realizes is where we are at right now from a pay structure is not as competitive as we want it to be. And so, in every one of these job positions, we have built in what I'm calling respectfully a regional differential. We have looked at the salary structures of all of our competition, labor competition around Southern Wisconsin. Down below, you will see the proposal and the projections, we're going to match our regional competition 100% in year one and year two. We can't quite get there yet, or at least I can't figure out how to get there yet. We're under the same level limits you guys are, right? I can't figure out how to get there in years three, four, and five. We're going to keep working on it, but I can't figure it out yet. We're at 50% of what that differential is right now. I can change these numbers in two seconds, right? If we decide we can afford 75% of the differential, it just change it and it recalculates everything, right? So that's how these numbers have, have been developed. Um, so six firefighter AMTs, six firefighter paramedics, six firefighter uh, lieutenant paramedics, so lieutenant firefighter paramedics. Um, right now in the model that the townships are working with, there are no part-time people built into that. We're doing it all with career. Um, obviously, that's, a, that's something that we could do, right, if all of a sudden this is looks expensive and how would we tweak some numbers here or there right we could go to some some part-time um, but we're not proposing that uh, 128 hours of paid on call uh, paid on premise in the building per week that's that person who would be the opposite of the 40-hour employee so there was always that fourth person in the building um, we will have to come up with a projection for the paid on call and the paid on premise. Um, there is actually a number in the formula. It's not blank, Dan, I just took it out of here. Um, only to say that's really gonna depend on how many municipalities wanna be part of this. If we have to try to make sure we've got a big enough paid on call pool to handle 918 calls a year, that's gonna be a different pool size than if we only have to cover 346 callbacks a year. Right, so there is a projection, but we just have to plug that in. And again, we understand how to do that. It includes six interns, three first year, three second year um, interns. Um, then there's the same thing. There is an overtime number, right? It's just, it is what it is, right? We're all running a business. Um, and again, that projection would be based on what we're trying to cover and how many people we'd have to cover for overtime and that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that so that's the input screen. Same is true for the operating costs. We, we built it based on a detailed breakout of the operating costs. Um, we built the capital based on a detailed breakdown of the capital. So so this screen is what leads to all of the calculations about how we came up with the numbers. Um, I probably use the word illustrative way too much, but I do mean that. We've had to use publicly available numbers. We've had to make some I would say educated guesses about how things would play out, but none of this is intended to be audited or, or aud right. It's not intended to be down to the penny, right? We're just trying to get a projection for these guys so they've got a feel for what that option looks like. Um, a couple of caveats that I would point out to you. Um, there are certain capital requirements that we've been able to project the, the most publicly known one, obviously, town of uh, Milton. Uh, we have an architect uh, and a pretty close to finalized design on a fire station. We know exactly what those costs are. We have the cost estimates. We know what our borrowing capabilities are and what the debt service associated. So that's plugged in there. 
we know there needs to be an ambulance that's plugged in there but beyond that if there are other capital things that would have to be addressed it's not in there is that just kind of where we're at um and then the one that came up actually somebody brought it up to me this morning so i'll apologize i wish i had given it some mind share before this morning um, depending on the jurisdiction that we are asked to cover, it's going to depend on the fire inspection requirements for that jurisdiction, right? Uh, again, I'll pick on my good friends from Johnstown, mainly because my family farms in Johnstown. That's why I keep picking on them all the time. We think we've got three inspectable buildings in Johnstown, <laughs> maybe four. In Edgerton, we have, what was the number last night? We just added that up, 512, something like that, right? So if we take on a jurisdiction where we only have to inspect three buildings, do that in a heartbeat, right? If we take on a jurisdiction where we have to inspect four or 500 buildings, we probably have to look at inspection costs that, that are not in here because I, I literally, I just missed that one. Um, so you have the, oops, I'm sorry, keep them wandering right through. You have the numbers. Um, what we did, the box above the line in essence is operating, right? So the things that would, that would fall under uh, levy limits. Um, and we tried to project how our operating costs would look versus um, the public available numbers uh, provided by Janesville. So, and I'll just walk through that line in year one, um, 891,186. Again, remember that had that one and a half percent inflation factor on discretionary expense, not on labor, but on, on operating expense. A six municipality, two stations with seven career um, plus the captain is three, uh, 933,000 in the first year, right? So slightly higher. A five municipality model with just the one station and five people comes in at 713,000 in the first year operating. So that's actually lower. Again, I'll say it for the 18th time. There are 80 iterations of this, right? We can, we can, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff to take it up, take it down, but that's just the model we created. That's what those numbers look like. You can see the breakout between the jurisdictions. Here's one of the hardest things to back into. The Janesville model is calculated using the current equalized value distribution of the current district, because that's the current district. The EFPD models are based on the changes that municipalities have made saying, I want 50%, not 40. I want 80 versus 10. So all of a sudden the numbers, they're gonna, they're gonna change on you in ways that intuitively you're gonna go, that makes no sense. It's because the equalized values are changing. One of the ways to do this obviously would just be to do a normalized version, assuming the current you know, distribution. But for these guys, when they're trying to figure out what their costs are for next year, we did it around what we were being asked. So that's one of the reasons that it's really hard to, to rationalize how some of these things change. Is that, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then below the line was the attempt to factor in the capital costs, those things that are outside of the levy limits. Um, we used the $175,000 number, which was in that publicly available document. Um, I know we made a comment, and I'm, I'm sure Dan was probably scratching his head while I was making it. Um, I, I, I don't know what's in that. I can't tell you what's in or what's missing or what should be in there or not, but I just used the number that was there. Um, it was just equipment. Okay, uh, yeah, so no buildings, just equipment. And, and that actually starts to make some sense. Um, the numbers under Model 2 and Model 3 include the facilities costs for either um, the one station or the two stations. And in 2024, it starts including Newville. 
obviously the simplest way to bring these numbers down is again not do newville i mean i i get that right no nobody has to point that one out to me except i'll go back to the map look at newville and and tell me we don't need to do something about newville so but it's in here what and, and i i coined or actually brian coined it and i've just picked it up and used it i try to reference its trademarkable source these are fully built out numbers right we've tried to include everything that, that you could throw at this thing um to be as realistic not to be as scary but just to be as realistic as we can um chief that that was something i i didn't pick up on in your presentation last week um so i, I guess sure. you're just registering with me now under the the six municipalities model you're you're indicating there'll be two new stations yes so you have appropriated a cost yes beyond the high street station yes how did you come to that number so and again this is where it's we, we i go back to the word illustrative mm -hmm. right if we do high street the way high street is designed mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of things we built into high street for for future the other one would basically be what we would consider a satellite mm -hmm. station, okay. right? Five people, you'd have an extra bedroom and that kind of stuff. Three bays, and, you know, two deep, so you can have two ambulances in it, engine, or maybe a ladder, another, right? Three bays, it's, it's a satellite station. So we went to our architect and said, okay, a lot, and the architect we're working with, same one you guys have worked with, they do, they do this all over the country they gave us the current projection for a satellite station. So that's what that's what's and it's in. not a pole shed. I'm sorry, what? It's not a pole shed. <laughs> no, um, just check. It is not a pole shed. It's actually it would be um, it would be a very respectable for the members who have to sleep in it, appropriate building um, for a satellite station. Um, a lot of you know, and I know the architects have said this numerous times to the townships, the build cycles and the construction costs right now are off the charts, right? When we started talking to them, we're also doing an expansion of the Edgerton station, not in your numbers, right? Because that's not, you know, right? But we're doing an expansion of the Edgerton station. When we first started that project, build costs were $175 a square foot. Brian, can you remember, John? 280 on high street now we're all hoping right that that's going to come back the other way and by the time we get to this it, it will but yeah this this is i i would tell you this is a very respectable appropriate satellite fire station what one additional question on yeah that, and i apologize that i no. didn't pick up on this last no. week is um, based on one of the maps that you had previously provided in there, it showed a prospective Milton West station that appeared as though it was on like Town Line Road. There was a yellow dot. Um, I'd use more reference to John Paul. Okay. Yeah, it looked like it was <laughs> just illustrative. Yeah. Um, so, so in the in the in the dollar figures for that Milton West station, is there is there a land cost consideration? No. Okay. No. All right. No, and that's that. And yeah, there's yes. We. And I think even Dan and I had a little bit of conversation about, we'd have to figure out where this makes sense. Now, I'll get back on my soapbox for a second. I remember about two hours ago, I said something about, you know, write one thing down, response time matters. Um, there's a sub bullet underneath that. Municipalities through time make very poor decisions about where to put fire stations. My classic, and I will not use the name of the jurisdiction, uh, and it's not even in southern Wisconsin. Um, they had some available land because no business wanted it in the back of the industrial park. So that's where they built their fire station. It was cheap land, right? Every one of their volunteers had to drive an extra four and a half minutes to get the trucks and an extra four and a half minutes to get back into the core of the city. They just added eight minutes to their response time to their constituents. That's crazy, right? So the one thing that the architects will flat out tell you about fire stations, they need to have direct access onto major transportation corridors. The further you put them off of a major transportation corridor, direct access, the, the, the poorer service you're providing your citizens. 
Um, and Brian, we talked a lot, John and Brian, you know, when we were looking at High Street in terms of what that does for transportation corridor and stuff, and, and Brian will even tell you, I wanted it directly on Highway 59, right? I want a lot of things. DOT reminded me I wasn't going to get that one, <laughs> right? So we figured out how to put it just off of 59, 26, M, all that kind of stuff. But I, that's a big one to me. You've got to put them in the right spots or you've just wasted a lot of money. Longer answer than you wanted, Al, but that's it. Yeah. And quite honestly, John, Paul, if you look at where these are, right, we've got good east-west. We looked at the railroad track issues and all that kind of stuff. By the way, it's not just one railroad track. You realize how many railroad tracks you have in the city, right? It, it's a trick as to how to do that right. We tried to look at it and make some suggestions about how to do it. As, as, as right as you can do it. Uh, Commissioner Alternatives owns that land on that corner, so it shouldn't <laughs> be a problem. Uh, well, yeah, we can talk to him. Um, <laughs> you have all five years, right? All we did was we took that original five-year projection that was done in the original Janesville model and just tried to mirror it out um, over time. It's the same exact, it's the same exact spreadsheet it just you know continues to build it out over five years. Not that I don't want to spend eight hours talking about the numbers. I'm really not. I don't want to write. You, you can look at them. You can see them. I think one important note for our folks who weren't able to attend the meeting last week um, as you're going through these five-year expenditures, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, yep. one, because I'm colorblind, and two, I made misspeak. But what, what Chief Pickering has done is when you see the, the, the boxes that are orange, that means that it is higher than the Janesville model. And when they're green, it means that the cost yes. is lower than the Janesville model. So when you look at year one, you say, oh my gosh, why are we even talking about this? It's more expensive. It's the out years where the, yep. where the savings starts to appear because of that nominal increase on an annual basis Yep. that would be agreed upon through the IGA at the onset of the yes thank, thank you for covering something I forgot yeah that's exactly right and, and you know we talked about it capital is an upfront loading kind of an issue right you're going to spend it up front or you're going to right and and again you guys get it there's 80 different ways to redo this right we could push stuff out we could pull stuff up but what we're trying to propose is what makes the most sense early on in the process for the most amount of people um, to get it right up front. Uh, a, good, a very good friend of mine, uh, one of my commissioners uh, who is not afraid to tell me what I'm doing wrong, um, put his hand around me one night and, and said, get this right. Because I mean, what we're looking at here, this world is not gonna get less complicated in terms of volunteers and demand on time and number of career that we're gonna to have to have, right? This is gonna to continue to be a challenge. If we're gonna do this, and he was talking at a broader scale, not just about what you folks are wrestling with, get it right. Because it, it needs to be able, instead of to be stagnant for 10 years and then 10 years from now, we're all looking at each other going, where's Pickering? I wanna kill him, right? I wanna give you something that can, continue to grow in a, in a regular evolutionary process. I have taken oh way too much time. Did I get most of these? Dan, I don't want to, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I tried, yes, I tried to did, hit them as I saw. Yeah. Um, so any other, I mean, I've, I've thrown way I, too much at you. I have, what um, Workforce development regions are you drawing staff from? You know, the whole state is divided. And if you don't know, you can just send it in an email, but I'm just curious of what regions you're drawing staff from. Okay. I, I'll, I'll have to research that one because I don't know how to answer that question for you. Okay. I, and I'll, I can send you the spreadsheet. Yep. And then you'll be able to. Okay. To yeah, figure that absolutely. Out. Is that but a I, question? So you give us the model for um, the number of full time staff for basically just two stations here in Milton, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to say, yeah, exactly. It's yep. sort of an east and a west. So it, with Newville added in, how many full-time firefighters do you think you'd have across the entire district? Well, so we Randy, have- Randy, do you want to speak into the microphone? Zoom isn't oh, hearing you. Oh, as soon as I go, yeah, yeah let me it, guess. As soon as I go that way, I, I, have a I, question, I apologize to those in Zoom land. Um, we have six today. 
our board actually just authorized us to go to eight. Um, so we're in the process of, of managing through that. Every one of these is planned to have three on duty as a planning number, again, plus or minus vacations and sickness and all that kind of stuff, but three in each of those buildings, four at Milton East, um, just because the building's built for it, and then that captain. So it would be, you know, three career plus whatever part-time paid on call were interns were in there, and then the additional management staff um, out of East. Yeah, my follow-up to that, I guess, was how many part-time staff members would you need for the entire district, all told? How I many part-time or how yeah, many career? Part-time. Just because, you know, you have 45 now for edge and fire. Oh, you're district. talking paid on call paid versus part-time. Yep. Sorry, that's a different Sorry, classification. Paid on call, that type of yeah. uh, situation. How many would you need for the entire district if you were to get all the municipalities involved with it? That we're talking about right now in situation two because is it edgerton you have 45 right now i don't know how many i thought we had 40 it's around 40 right? 41 just over 40. Yep. um most of our well i won't say it that way all of our projections are utilizing the, the resources you have the commission has available to it today we're not projecting to add more we're not we're certainly hoping not to have less that partly is what leads to that career staffing model, right? If, if, we, if we have dramatically less for whatever reason, right, then you end up having to augment it with, with career. So right now, we're, the number we actually, um, so the plan basically, and, I, and I'm gonna make this sound more than it really is. When we looked at the design of Newville, one of the things you gotta be very careful of from a training perspective we don't wanna take all of the Milton firefighters and send them all the way to our training center, which is on the east west side of Edgerton, right? Because now when there's a call on High Street, there's gonna be somebody really mad at you. Same is true, we don't wanna take all of our Edgerton firefighters and send them all the way over to High Street because we had the opportunity to build a really nice training facility. East has is, is got a lot of land, it's got a lot of things to it, but right, so we actually planned for Newville to be the illustrative headquarters facility, it has the large training room. We size that for 90. If you want a point of reference, that's what we size the training room for. I want to go back to your chart that had the 100% volunteer combination, 100% uh, career, um, and you've got a uh, an arrow down at the bottom, moving from left to right, uh, moving from 100% volunteer toward 100% career, or 100% volunteer to 100% career. Can you talk about, is yeah. It, is it the blue one right there? Yeah. yeah. So that is our evolution since Jason and I came on board at Edgerton. What, what, I, what I'm hearing you say is that that evolution continues. Yes. Uh, and is likely to continue. Um, any any projections on when it goes all the way out there to the 100% career? Is that um, you know a 20 year? I think one of the one of the concerns that we've got is: Are we talking about a three year solution, a five year solution, sure. a 10 year solution, a 20 year solution? I know you can't answer that, um, but can you give us some thoughts? I, I, I can, and, and I'd certainly accept you know, other comments that, that Chief Rhodes and Chief Russ might have as well. If you look at the names that are on there, right, the 100% career departments, obviously the, the Milwaukee's, the Green Bay's, the Brookfield's, the Kenosha's, the Racine's, the Janesville's, um, we are our current district we're a long ways of being in the top 10 percent of all the fire departments in the state of wisconsin notwithstanding what comes ever after covid whatever the next generation's beliefs are about volunteering we're actually seeing something pretty unusual 
the cadets that we're getting that are coming out of the high school right now at the cadet level seem to be much more interested in the in the volunteering to help their community than some of the current generation we're wrestling with so you're right my crystal ball isn't any better than than yours or anybody else's it is not in i think our lifetime that the edgerton fire protection district gets to the far right hand side of that chart what we have continually said to our board is we've got to relook at this every year and we've got to do this incrementally. And if we get there in 20 years, because it forced us to get there in 20 years, what you don't want to do is be in year 19 and go, oh, we got to make this jump, right? You've got to have done that over the last 19 when it made sense. Is it, is it fair to say that this would move us into that Ashland Menominee town of Brookfield? category i mean are we getting close to that i my personal opinion is we're right square in the middle and and we're proposing to bring you in or or the the municipalities we're talking to right in the middle menominee and ashland are predominantly career so now you're talking so so ashland i think it's 27 career firefighters and i believe they have 12 paid on call Right, so the numbers, right? We are in essence going to eight career, 45 paid on call. I, I'm not on the right half of this chart yet. And, and I don't think we need to be. Again, we, we're, we're doing pretty well. I, I, you know, I'm a taxpayer just like you, right? I'm not gonna spend money that we don't need to spend, but I'm also a fire chief and I'm gonna make sure trucks roll. Maybe a different way of asking Bill's question, because I think he's on a very good train of thought. Um, if, if you go with the six municipality model, yep. plus the existing yep. board. So your Edgerton's currently at eight under that model, eight, eight full time. Yep. And if we, under that model, you would be adding an additional seven. Do I have that number correct? Yep. yep. So, so at that yep. point you're at 15. The second half of that number probably depends on individuals availability though, right? Absolutely. So when you say 45, it may be a situation in which you really have 10 people oh. who you can count on oh. like that and 35 that kind of fill in. Na so nationally, the, the average is you need seven to get one at any given point in time, right? So I'm not looking to bring in 10 guys when the tones go off. I'm looking to bring in four to make sure I've got another legal first response engine crew, right? So yes, you're absolutely right. It 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 is a numbers it is a numbers game. I mean, there's no way around that. It's you have to have a big enough pool that at any given point in time, um, they come in. But the, but that pool has to be incredibly variable. We go back to the really early yeah. onset of your presentation. You talked about how you need to find the folks. You need to cater your program or your department to their individual needs. Yes. So again, you might have somebody who's got 12 hours to spare in a week, and you might have somebody who's only got four hours to spare yep. in a week. So you've got to get three of those four hours to make up for one of those 12 hours. Absolutely. So it makes that number really big and look potentially scary, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily indicative. It should be in my, I guess, I guess looking at it a different way, how many hours of POP Correct. and POC. Correct. That would be probably a more yeah. And, and, and we've also, as you notice, that captain who would be a working captain, right? This is not an administrative person. This is a person that's going to be in the right front seat of that first out engine from that station, right? It's a working individual. That's a daytime person because that's when you need the extra help. We have, we have one 40 hour employee out of those six that we have today. One of them is a daytime employee for just that reason, because we need to over index during the day on career because we know we can get it. We do a better job in the evening. So you're absolutely right. That's the that's the the art of staffing this kind of a model. There's a great article. It was done about 10 years ago called the combination fire service. The best of both worlds, the worst of both worlds. It is very, very, very hard to manage a career, a combination fire department. It is very hard and, and you have to work at it. You gotta know how to do it because you can screw it up real easy. 
What's your, your average number of openings that you have to fill in any given category each year? Do you know? Um, career, we've been pretty stable, right? We've, um, I, I could tongue in cheek say, uh, and actually it's not tongue in cheek, <laughs> it's actually a fact of, of, of planning. We watch when Janesville is hiring and when Beloit is hiring and when Madison is hiring and when Green Bay is hiring and we can predict when we're going to have an opening. Right. So our need to backfill on the career side is more dependent on what other departments that offer other advantages to, to people are. But we understand how to manage that. Right. That's, that's right. Um, on the paid on call side. Um, this is a very transient world nowadays. The people who came and lived in Edgerton for 25 years and, and right, they, there's one or two of them. I, we have, and we, we chuckle about it. We have a couple of young paid on call members of our department. We absolutely get, we're investing the heck into them because we realize they're gonna be here for 25 years. Th these are just the people that are gonna be here for a long time. But we also know there's a large percentage Jobs going to open up in Wausau, or jobs going to open up in Boca Raton. So we're we are constantly recruiting, and continuing to refresh on the paid on call side. Do you do you primarily work with like Hawk Technical Colleges, or what? Do you have a favorite <laughs> college? I mean, they're all Ooh. over. They're all over. You're going to make me say that on a Zoom meeting, aren't you? <laughs> um, no, you don't have to. You can no, email it no, to me. I, I'm just I, curious. I we have an absolutely unfair advantage and, and i and i say this it's a nightmare because because jason and i have to go to three different chiefs associations we protect territory in dane county rock county and jefferson county we go to all those meetings we have full access to madison area college we have full access to blackhawk we have several people who are instructors for for those institutions um so we use the institutions that are available to us. And it's usually not a favorite, in all honesty, it's not a favorite, but if Blackhawk's running a class and we need somebody, we're gonna, we're gonna go to Blackhawk, right? If, if Blackhawk isn't and Madison area is doing it, we go to Madison area and we actually have some relationships. Uh, we had a couple of people last year that needed a particular certification. We sent them over to Waukesha Area Tech to get that certification. I, I'm good friends with the Dean over there. So we were able to work that out. <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 that's why I go back to this is very hard to manage. This is this is very hard to manage. But if you understand how to manage a combination world, it can be very successful. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. you. Uh, Blackhawk is is really stepping their game up, though. For those who don't know, they are building an absolutely state of the art fire and emergency services training facility down there that we actually were talking about the other night is probably going to help from a recruiting standpoint because it is really well done. You are probably sick and tired of listening to me. Questions? Um, so I, thank you very much. I, I mean, I really do commend you. I, I said this to the town boards at the beginning. I'll say it to you at the end. Um, I've been doing this for a little while, right? 45 years and I get the seats that you're sitting in. This is probably, without a doubt, in the top three, if maybe not the top one, I think for some of the townships, it probably is the top decision, but for you, you guys have had a lot of decisions through the years. This is probably one of the most decisions you're gonna make as an elected official. So I commend you for doing the research, asking the questions, you have my card, you have my phone. Um, with that, I am going on vacation next week, so don't expect an answer <laughs> next week. <laughs> and I'll be at uh, the International Association of Fire Chiefs the week after, but I'll have my computer with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody that came and everybody that listened to this a second or third time or however many times you've listened to it. Um, we appreciate you coming out and hearing this information with us tonight. And thank you to city council who has had lots of meetings and will continue to have lots of meetings. Thanks everyone. Is there any other general items for anybody? Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? We're adjourned, thank you.